Um, this is the next uh, video in the series on Middle English. We talked about uh, the, the invasion of the Normans and the, um, the uh, legacy of French in the English language, particularly in its lexicon. Now we're going to talk about um, the, the, basically an overview of Middle English and the linguistic changes that it underwent. Um, by the time, uh, mostly by the time that we meet this guy here, although he's really a part of a period of rapid change. Um, two major facts about the Middle about Middle English is one is it survived. You know, um, the, the Celtic language uh, uh, that was spoken in England, it didn't survive. Not in England. It, it carried on in Wales and Cornwall and Brittany, but in England it stopped being spoken. It continued. Uh, the language of the invaders came to be spoken, the language of the Germanic people, tribes that came into Britain, the Angles, the Saxons. Um, but then when the Normans invaded, they spoke French for a while, but most people didn't. Um, now, you know, only about 10% of the population at most ever spoke French in England. And so English survives, but also it changes rapidly. Why? It changes more quickly than it did in the Old English period, as far as we can tell, and it changes quicker than it has subsequently. Um, so why did English survive? That's the first question. One, it continued to be spoken as the language of the common people. Monastic scri scribes kept standard Old English alive. Um, there, there's a, one famous uh, writer is called the Tremulous Hand of Worcester. We think he has a shaky hand. Um, and th this written poetic uh, English continues to be carried on, particularly in the west of England, and some people connect it with the uh, revival of alliterative poetry in the 1300s among such poets as um, uh, you know, the, the Pearl Poet and the Gawain um, and uh, William Langland, although there may have been a continuous oral tradition of alliterative poetry, we don't know. Um, there were a limited number of French speakers, 5% of the total population of England, um, but the Normans, as we said, they pulled off their ability to dominate this population through the um, use of heavy cavalry and castles. Um, the bonds between Normans in England and France weakened over time. So, you know, these Normans come over and they speak French, but they're living in England, and um, it, 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 by 1204, this is when the uh, English crown loses its current claim to the Duchy of Normandy. And so without that continuous connection and without the continuous territorial holdings of that, that England had had in France all the way through the 12th century, um, you stop having the, the, you start having the aristocracy, the nobility of England identify more and more with England as English people. And by the end of the 1200s, it's, it's increasingly common that even the nobility's first language is English, and they are learning French from a tutor. And of course, this is why they start getting tutors, not from Normandy, um, but from central France, who speak the prestige dialect of French. And this is what, when we get a big sort of uh, wave of central French rather than Norman French coming in, as we discussed in the last video. Um, also, in the, four, in the 1300s and 1400s, there is a revival of English during the 100 Years' War. That's supposed to say war. I should fix that. Um, and this culminated in the language policies of Henry V, uh, who briefly conquered France, but also made uh, England, English an official language. So it does eventually come back, and the consciousness of nationalism, I guess you can call it an early kind of nationalism of the, Eng of the English fighting the French, makes them sort of more identify with being English more. And this is when you start getting a great upsurge in English literature and um, laws and writing. And, 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 it, and it starts English, the number of domains. Remember this idea of discourse domains? Um, you know, law, government, medicine, science, religion, all these are different domains. And, and they can, in, in a multiglossic society, those domains can be distributed between different languages. Well, as a, lang as a language's prestige increases, more of those domains go over to that language with the increasing prestige. They more become English. And so Anglo-Norman was losing its prestige relative to Parisian French, as we discussed above. Um, why did English change so rapidly? Well, uh, regional divergences means more far-reaching changes. There's no central authority ruling over England, uh, that's setting the standard for English. 
because the central authority for several hundred years is speaking French. Um, moreover, it's always been sort of more the upper crust of society that travels from place to place more and, and uh, has connections. Most people in the Middle Ages were tied to the land and they didn't, they didn't uh, ever travel more than 10 or 20 miles from the town that they were born in. And so they didn't, um, people who spoke English didn't have as much contact with each other, for, uh, people from other regions. And so regional divergences means more far-reaching changes. When you uh, th think about Darwin's finches on the island, the Galapagos Islands being cut off from each other, not being able to sort of communicate or mate with each other, there's, there's this like, speciesation process that goes on. This is what happens. You know, we talked about the role of language contact and causing language change. Language isolation also causes language change. There's no, as I said, there's no prestige variety to enforce standards and slow down change, right? Um, a standard, a, a, the idea that there's a correct grammar in some ways freezes a language, right? If there's nobody to, if a child says, you know, I, th I, I think didn't, and nobody corrects him or her because um, there's no sense of what right English is, then the language changes more quickly. Um, there's uh, also an influx of French words puts pressure on the lexical system um, so that not just there's not just this uh, influx of French words but they change the meanings in many play cases of English words because um, because when you have doublets when you have redundancies a language likes to be efficient or there tends to be a, a systematic process by which the full range of possible meanings, the words are spread over them. So, for example, the word apple in middle in Old English means fruit, right? Any kind of fruit. And then the word fruit comes in, that's the modern pronunciation of, of fruit, comes into Middle English. And so you have two words meaning the same thing. So what happens? There's a, narrow, a semantic narrowing. Remember from the handout, there's different types of semantic changes. There's a narrowing of apple. To, uh, to, to just mean the, the red or green shiny pomerian rather than any kind of fruit, because we have that word fruit now. And there, there's a number of cases in which this happens. Um, and here's the big thing. Here's the big mondo change from Old English. Inflections are reduced and simplified. We see an, an acceleration of a tendency we see in a lot of Indo-European languages of a movement from a fusional to an isolating language. That is, the grammatical relationships of a sentence are mainly indicated by prepositions and a fixed word order. Remember, I see the good stone, um, the, the good stone is rolling down the hill, all that stuff from our old English presentation. Well, you, when you lose the case endings, you can't move around the word and still know that it's an object anymore. It has to come after the verb. That's how you know it's a direct object. And as this is going on, many to most grammatical endings disappear, um, but not all. So, three important facts about Middle English, just to sum up. Its phonology is like Old English. Middle English is kind of looking in two directions at the same time. It's still pronounced very much like Old English, even if the writing system changes, and we'll talk a little bit about that in the next video. But its syntax and lexicon is like Modern English. Is supposed to say modern English. Um, of course, the syntax and lexicon of Middle English is like Middle English. Ugh. Anyway, I'm not redoing this right now because I'm already eight minutes in. Morphology is in transition. Um, that means that the, the case endings, the sound endings are changing. So an example of this, the general reduction of inflections. We had uh, the word mouth in Old English was mouth, mouth, right? It's the nominative semouth, uh, this bismuth is famutha, and so on and so forth. Um, by the time we get to London Standard Middle English of several centuries after Old English, it's just mutha, mutha, smutha, mutha, right? Where the only case that survives is the genitive, or as we come to know it now, the possessive. Muth, muths, right? And so every other case pretty much ends, except we have in the, an accusative in the plural here. But mostly we have a reduction also, we have a replacement of the N plural form with S. Now, the N still survives in a few words, right? Like ox, oxen, child, children, um, brother, brethren. 
is an old form, but that's been replaced by brothers, right? Which was formed by analogy with the way that most other words. And so analogy is one of the main processes by which um, inflectional decay occurs. Um, but we, if the plural of I used to be ion, right? You have two ion, but now we have two eyes. And so the, gradually, this is, one, this is one of the ways that the language has simplified. So we also have a loss of grammatical gender. You no longer have a masculine stone or a feminine ship or what have you. Um, the everything just, it's just, you know, the only place gender remains is in pronouns. You lose singular and plural distinction in adjectives. It's no longer those beans are goods. It's, it's those beans are good, right? Or those beans are spices. No, those beans are spicy, right? We, we don't make adjectives agree with the noun in number. Um, demonstrative adjectives, uh, we had many kinds and they all just collapse into one this and these. Pronouns, we get the replacement gradually of the um, they, them, their form, um, although there's an intermediate form, as we see in Chaucer, of they, her, hem, where we've adopted the Old Norse for the subject and then still using the Southern English forms for the uh, possessive and the objective. Many strong conjugation verbs become weak and consolidated into fewer classes. In other words, um, you know how we have words like drink, drank, drunk, swim, swim, swum? Well, we used to have a lot more of those and more kinds, and there was a sense that there was this, like, a number of different systematic kinds. If you study Old English, you'll learn these, but these become fewer and fewer. Although later in the modern English period, there will be some new strong verbs coined in um, the early modern English period by analogy, um, but, and some stick, but basically, by the end of the 1600s and the early 1700s, we're not making new strong verbs anymore. Um, the distinct participle ending and or end, so like slepend for sleeping or walkend for walking, um, this survives for a long time in the north and the west, but is replaced by ing in the south and the east. Um, once more about the loss of grammatical gender. Is it because of the simplification of demonstratives and adjectives? But this is something that moves from north to south as well, um, and, and you might you might look at that in term in your um, corpus activities. Uh, so one one other thing relative to Old English, the possible word order patterns are limited. There's more use of prepositions. Here's an early Middle English poem, "The Owl and the Nightingale," and I'll read it aloud to you just so you can hear the sound of Middle English and then compare it with the Old English. Each was in on a summer dava. In ona sutha dichel hala, i her de each hold great at hal on hula and ona nichting gala. That, that yo, that letter there is called the yo. And it, it's either in front of a syllable, it has a yo sound, at the end of a syllable it has a g, like a g, like g, g. Nichting gala. Thought plate was stiff and stark and strong, so we were soft and rude among, and either eigen or other small. And what thought wool mode ut all. And either said of other as Krusta, that all the worst of that he wusta, and hor and hor of other song, he who the fading sooth a stronger. So that's, uh, that's some um, old English. And you can look at the, when you look at the PowerPoint, you can compare the syntax. Um, another thing about Middle English, by the way, is that there ain't nothing wrong with no double negatives. Um, in many world languages, such as Spanish and French, um, there is, uh, when you, when you have more than one negative, it doesn't negate the negative. It's not like, it's not like, I don't not like it, you know, it sort of makes it mean it's like, I do like it, you know. Um, that doesn't, that's not the case in Middle English. In the Middle English, we have what's called multiple negation or negative concord, that more negatives just intensify the, the negativeness. Um, so, you know, in the Old English, not harmed job, not the devil's temptation, right? The double negative reinforces. Same in Middle English. That none of us ne speak and not a word, that to no wicht we shall this counsel rea. This is from Chaucer's Troas and Crusader. And he's saying, don't tell anyone, basically, is what this means. That none of us ne speak not a word, that to no white thou shall this counsel rea. And um, also we get in Middle English, and this is unique to Middle English, compound negatives. Um, and we, don't, we don't say wouldn't or isn't, 
or doesn't, but we have this ne that comes before a verb to negate it, and it gets compounded. So ne wolda means nolda, and that means wouldn't or won't. Ne is niz, and that means isn't. Ne wist is nis, and that means dunno, doesn't know. Ne will is nil. And actually, if you've ever heard the expression willy-nilly, as in he'll do it willy-nilly, whether he wants to or not, that's a weird little fossil of Middle English for you right there. That's all we got for you right now. Um, but uh, I hope this has been helpful and, and illuminated some of the more confusing things about this PowerPoint. Um, uh, and I'll try to, and I'll fix those uh, mistakes. Um, so if you're watching this in the future, uh, they've already been fixed. Yay, bye.